All right, so welcome to the Mailbox Money Show. I am Bronson Hill, and I am joined by a good friend of mine, Paul Moore from Wellings Capital. Uh, a little bit about Paul, besides being an exceptional guy and a great friend, he has over 17,000 self-storage, multifamily, and other manufactured home units. They've had 85 investment exits. Uh, he's been featured on HGTV's House Hunters, and they currently have over 500 million in real estate. He's also written the book, which is a great book. It's called The Perfect Investment. Uh, it's kind of one way that I learned years ago about multifamily investing. So, uh, Paul, welcome. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. And just to be clear before we move on, uh, we have investments in that many assets. Now, we're not an operator. So, we our goal is to be a due diligence partner to our investors and we find the best operators we can. We invest in their portfolios. So we don't have that much invested, just to be clear, but we're part of that many investments. So, but we're really just having the time of our lives doing this. Awesome. Well, it really is a, a gift to be able to do this. Sometimes I pinch myself and say, wow, I, I get paid to do this, work with yeah. investors and do these amazing deals. But Paul, you're someone that I know is just a, a great guy and great reputation in the industry. Just love, you know, of course, being your friend and of course, having you on here today. But just give us a quick overview of your background and your business. Yeah. Um, so I sold my company to a publicly traded firm in 97 and I found myself at 34 years old a uh, high energy entrepreneur looking at kind of a semi-retirement and I was bored to death. And so I started flipping houses then started flipping waterfront lots at Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia. And then uh, started building houses, did modular homes, did a subdivision, did lease to own homes, started a couple real estate websites to sell leads. I had done all this stuff but I didn't know how to get into commercial real estate. And I kind of thought, man, the wealthy guys, they're all in commercial. Maybe I need to learn that, but I didn't know how to get in. I'd heard of syndication, but I thought it was something to do with the Godfather movie. And uh, I didn't really know where, where was the, you know, where was the on-ramp for commercial real estate? And I got thrust into it when my buddy and I built a multifamily quasi hotel in North Dakota to be part of the oil boom there in 2011. And uh, ended up, after years of managing that, ended up writing a book on multifamily investing. And that brought me to where I knew how to syndicate, but I couldn't find deals that made sense. And so we expanded out, like I mentioned, to be a due diligence partner for hundreds of investors to go out and find the very best deals we can in a multiple uh, with in multiple asset classes, including self-storage, mobile home parks, um, manufactured housing is another word for that. Um, also in light industrial and in multifamily, whenever we can find deals that make sense, at least. Yeah, absolutely. And you bring up a really good point, Paul. And I talk about this quite a bit is that at the end of the day, uh, you know, we all do real estate because of not necessarily that we just love real estate, you know, as, as a just, you know, on its own, we love really what real estate provides for us, right? We love the tax benefits. We love the returns. We love how it performs, particularly uh, multifamily and self-storage and mobile homes. We love how these perform in times of recession or times that are good and bad, which I think is amazing. But why don't you talk to us? I want you to really focus in a little bit on, you know, you wrote the book on multifamily, you literally wrote the book, which is an amazing book. Anybody wants to be educated, The Perfect Investment, it really is, uh, you know, really a great place to start when you, if you want to understand multifamily. But talk to us a little bit about self-storage, because I know there came a point for you where kind of what was happening was, you know, the market was changing and you kind of felt like, hey, I really want to make a pivot uh, away from this and more into self-storage being one of the things. So can you talk a little bit about self-storage and what you like about it? Yeah, it was a Thursday morning and a guy named Chris called me and he said, hey, uh, I know we got on, I got on your schedule to talk about multifamily. He said, I'm a multifamily syndicator, but I'm not doing that anymore. I'm doing self-storage. You want to hear about it? And I, because I'm a nice guy, he couldn't <laughs> see my face. And I said, sure. But my face was saying, oh, no. Yeah. And anyway, by the end of 30 minutes, he had talked me into another two and a half hour call to hear more details. And I was completely sold. And fast forward several years now, I just wrote a book on self storage. It's being published by Bigger Pockets Publishing next month. But, um, 
Yeah. What happened is I found out there was a lot of great things about self-storage. There's about 53,000 self-storage facilities in the U S which is about the same as McDonald's subway and Starbucks combined, but about 50% are owned by mom and pop owners. And that means they don't usually have the resources or the knowledge or the desire to increase income and maximize value. But the debt structure and the syndication structure and the returns are similar to multifamily, but there's a lot of more meat on the bones on these, you know, mom and pop deals. And so I love that. There's a lot of value add. You can add, you know, a showroom where you sell locks, boxes, tape, scissors, upgrade units. Um, you can sell uh, insurance, tenant insurance. You can charge late fees. You can get the rents up to market. You can move the unit sizes to fit what clientele want at this time. You can actually use software and a website. Can you believe that? Uh, yeah. Which a lot of these mom and pops don't do. They say, we don't need to. We're already 100% full. And I'm just saying, hey, wait a minute. If you're 100% full, maybe you're not charging enough. Well, anyway, yeah. there's a lot of value add. I'm not making fun of anybody. I live here in the mountains of Virginia. I love it. But uh, seriously, um, there's a lot of upgrades you can do. You can add you know, paid parking. RV parking, boat parking, storage like that. That's all real popular right now. You can add climate controlled buildings. Sometimes there's vacant acres with these self storage facilities. But another thing that we love about it is there's sticky tenants. I mean, if I'm renting you an apartment in LA for 2000 a month and I raise the rent by 8%, you might walk away rather than pay another, what's that, 160 dollars a month or about 18 1900 dollars a year for that apartment but if i'm renting you a hundred dollar storage unit and it's raised by eight percent well you're probably not going to take a weekend get your friends together to move your junk i mean your stuff i mean your treasures <laughs> down the street to save eight dollars a month so tenants are really sticky and so and another thing is it's recession resistant i didn't say recession proof but I mean, it does well in times of distress. There's the four Ds, which is downsizing, dislocation, divorce, and what's the other one? I can't remember. But anyway, they're the, dis, probably, <laughs> yeah. And so um, downsizing, dislocation, death, and divorce, that's it. Okay. And so the, the, when people are experiencing these, they temporarily need a place to store their stuff, but sometimes temporarily turns into years. And like I said, they usually don't mind a little bit of price increase at a time. It's a month to month contract. They can leave at any time, but they typically don't. So there's a lot of things to love about self-storage and that's why uh, we invest in it. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, you brought up something really uh, interesting within real estate investing is really that, you know, we get paid well to come in and solve a problem. So when the operator that's a mom and pop and a lot of self-storage, a lot of mobile home parks, uh, they're not run by really sophisticated, you know, institutional groups. It's, it really is mom and pop. It's a couple. It's, you know, people, they have an out, you know, out of very owner and they have a manager in there or something. And like you said, they're 100 percent occupied. They don't realize that they can raise rents and the value of these, multi, whether it's a self-storage or multifamily or whatever type of asset, it's all based on the income. Right. So mm -hmm. the ability to come in and and add those different resources and, and, you know, make more services for tenant and just, you know, bring those increases. It's amazing, you know, how you can kind of raise the rents on those. So let me ask you this, how do you go about finding a, a great deal? I know deals right now are getting harder to find pretty much in every asset class, but how does it work with self-storage? Do you go door knocking or send mailers? Do you have brokers? Like what are the ways that, you know, you guys, or maybe your partners find really great deals? Yeah, so we've got several operating companies that we um, we invest with. Like I said, we're not the operator. And the two that are doing the best at acquisition, one of them has scouts or feelers all over the country where they basically have people they'll pay really well to find deals. And they'll door knock or they'll go around the brokers or they'll talk with you know different people in the market. And that's one way. But the way that's crushing it most is a friend of mine in Nevada. Uh, we invested, I think we've invested like $37 million with them over the last several years. Um, they have a team of seven people working the phones, working Google Maps, working GIS, et cetera, all the time. So, you know, 
eight hours a day, five days a week, they're working the phones, making calls. And when they make these calls, they're talking to the owners and they're asking if they want to sell. And they have, you know, with seven people full time making, you know, well over, you know, a thousand calls, maybe a couple thousand calls a week, they're able to call through their whole national list several times a year. So for example, one guy they called was 88 years old in Michigan with a very large mobile home park. And he, they called him every quarter for seven years. Now he was 95 and they got a call from his niece. And she said, Hey, we, we were here with, you know, my uncle and we finally convinced him to sell. How much did you offer him two years ago? And they said, well, X, but is that enough? And she goes, that's enough. He, he doesn't need that much money anyway. So you know, they bought from him. They, they had called him, you know, something like four times a year for seven years. So it's that kind of persistence that kicks yeah. down doors that nobody else is getting access to. Yeah, it really is amazing. We just uh, have, I have a friend who was, um, you know, working on a multifamily deal recently and they were one of 42 offers and on a over $40 million multifamily, they put down, I think they had to put a million, it was 2 million in earnest money. So literally that's, you know, basically non-refundable. I think day one was a million and, you know, you just, these very competitive situations. So the way people really find deals, and it really is a great uh, way that you can help find solutions for people. Uh, and like, you know, for this guy, it's not that it's just that you're coming in and you're, you know, buying it for something that's less than what it's worth. You, you may be able to, you know, work some things that are really creative for that person as well, right? Because a lot of right. you know, these mom and pops, they may own this thing outright. And if they sell it, they'll have $2 million in gains and pay really high taxes. So sometimes you can even work in some sort of sales program where, you know, you give them kind of sales installments over the next several years, or you maybe sell at the right time or, you know, they don't want, are there some of those special situations that you guys see as well? We're able to kind of get a hold of, of, you know, certain deals and kind of work with owners in a way that kind of makes sense for them. Yeah, we can, I mean, there's owner financing things where you can, you know, put it on like a 30 year uh, term to owner finance. It, and then you could even, I mean, I'm not saying that I've personally seen this done, but I've got a friend who said he's seen a bunch of deals where if they want their cash, uh, you can actually loan them the money and put it on a loan. And you can like, let's say it's $5 million, you loan them 5 million, and then you start making installment payments on their property and you don't actually buy it outright. They hold the deed for 30 years. But, um, and then at the end of 30 years, they've paid back their loan to you and you've paid off their property, which happens to be about the same payment. And so, again, I haven't seen that personally, but I, I know somebody in actually in your area who arranges deals like that all the time. And that's one way to do it. There's another thing called a Delaware statutory trust, which is something we've done. There's also a deferred sales trust. Uh, there's all types of ways to save money on capital gains. And as these gains, these taxes, you know, are threatened to go up now, I'm guessing you're going to see a lot more of this type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's, it really is, you know, trying to find ways to be creative. And for the listeners, some of our listeners, you know, are, are more passive. They just want to invest. Hey, I'm busy. I make money in my job. Just give me something with tax benefits and that will help me to get a decent return. Other people, they want to do it themselves. And really this kind of a creative approach where you're willing to do the extra work or hire people to do that. It's amazing the things that can come about with that. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Um, I know you basically, you know, so typically right now we do mostly individual deals. We'll do a multifamily. We'll do, uh, you know, certain, you know, individual properties, but you're doing a fund that invests in different types of asset classes. Can you maybe touch base just, you know, what are some of the pluses and minuses of investing in a fund versus a deal and kind of, you know, if an investor is new to that concept, can you just kind of talk sure. about that? And maybe also how it compares to like a REIT or something, maybe kind of touch base on, on those. Yeah. So a REIT gives out 1099s and a fund like ours or a syndication, you know, they give out K1. So all the tax benefits are passed through to the investors. That's one benefit of a fund or a syndication over a REIT. Um, one other benefit is you get diversification. You get to 
spread your money across multiple geographies and asset types and uh, assets and strategies and operators. And so you get to, you know, you could do one $100,000 investment and see it spread over 120 properties. Well, that would be really hard to do on your own. Uh, you also get a due diligence partner, somebody like us who's finding the deals, who's doing a lot of due diligence. We were on a plane to Scottsdale, Arizona this week. Uh, also to, uh, let's see, we were in Beverly Hills this week. We were in Orange County this week, Newport Beach, looking at different operators and deals. Uh, we'll be on the plane to Texas pretty soon looking at something else. And so we do this kind of due diligence so our uh, partners don't have to. Now, there are some downsides. Uh, one with a syndication, you usually know exactly what you're investing with and who. And well, this is a little bit more like a semi-blind pool. I mean, we tell you the parameters up front, but we and we can tell you some of the deals we'll be in, but not all of them. Uh, another disadvantage is there's a second layer of fees. There's a fee from the syndicator or the operator, and then there's a fee from us and a split. So you're getting a less, you know, you're getting a lower percentage of the deal. Now, our argument is if we're getting twice as good a deal, and I mean that literally, uh, we've got syndicators who are averaging 40, 50, 60% IRR sometimes, and they're, they're, they're just getting access to such amazing deals consistently. Our argument is, you know, if you're losing 5% of that, you know, it's, a, it's still way, way better than, you know, getting the whole smaller pie. But that could be a disadvantage in investing in a fund for sure. Right, right. Yeah. So a lot of people, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I've kind of thought about that as well, where you, you know, you have one asset, you can look very specifically at it. If there's underperformance, you know, which one, and you know, if it's a fund, it's a little harder to tell, but yeah. then again, it's really your, what people are really paying for is that extra level of diligence that you provide and the trust that, you know, Hey, Paul's going to, you know, do what's best for me or the person operating the fund is going to do what's, what's best. Uh, so I wanted to just kind of uh, ask you this, this is again, shifting gears a little bit, but for you, um, I know you've done a lot of things in your real estate career and you've had all kinds of experience in the business world and you're doing, I mean, you've got your hands on a lot of different things, even with some of the resort uh, you know, property you do as well. But uh, looking back, Paul, what, what are maybe, maybe what's one thing you would do differently in your real estate career or what's some advice maybe you'd give to people starting out, whether actively or passively? Hanson, how many hours do you have? I yeah, mean, my well, goodness, I had, I, I had a hours. podcast <laughs> called How to Lose Money. I could talk about this all day, my friend. But um, yeah, the one big thing I will say is I was at a mastermind last week and they had uh, the founder of Priceline in. And he said, you know, um, his friend um, who was the founder of Amazon.com, Jeff Bezos, sold books only for seven years. He had it down pat. He got a gold medal in selling books, but he could have done a lot more, but he resisted the temptation to chase shiny objects. He resisted the temptation to go out of his lane until he was the very best in the world in that lane. And so I think one of the big mistakes I've made over the years is chasing shiny objects, getting diversified too much. Again, Jeff Hoffman from Priceline, the founder of Priceline said, you know, uh, starting four product lines or four businesses at once is not four times harder. It's 4 million times harder. And so I would just say, you know, like, like Gary Keller said, the old Chinese proverb, he who chases two rabbits catches neither. And that's what I've done so poorly over the years. And I'm really, really taking that to heart and being very, very careful uh, now to not do that again. You know, it's really easy to do that, Paul. I'm really glad you brought that up because I think a lot of investors start out and they're like, oh my gosh, I've discovered real estate investing. I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to buy another house. Then I'm going to do, you know, self-storage. or I'm going to do larger, you know, multifamily or syndication or small multifamily. And it's, it's just kind of like, jump around thing. You never get good at anything and you're not really in one specific thing. And uh, they asked Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, both independently, you know, not together. They say, well, what, what's the single most thing, the most important thing that's made you successful. And they both had the same answer and it was focus, the ability to just focus on one thing. And I think what you said is just hundred percent in line with that. It's like, you know, you're never going to be world-class even if you're doing two things and trying to do them really well, you have to really focus in and say, 
this is it. I want to get really, really good at this. Um, I, I, I love that. Um, so kind of also for, for uh, people right now, um, I think one thing that everybody's talking about when it comes to investing and with real estate and just with finance in general is inflation, right? We're talking that inflation is, you know, 5%, 6%, it's transitory, it's not transitory. Uh, you know, what, what sort of risk do you see uh, inflation being for individuals and how do, uh, how would you say investors can protect themselves? Well, I'm holding a handful of $10 trillion bills here. Uh -huh. and they really are $10 trillion bills and some other bills in there from Zimbabwe. And um, the, uh, of course, this will buy you a cup of coffee, I'm guessing. And um, inflation is very real. It's very serious. I don't think we're going to have hyperinflation for a lot of reasons. But I do think that there is going to be real inflation that's going to continue for a while. And um you know, I'm old enough to remember my grandparents and even my parents' generation getting their savings ravaged by inflation in the late 70s and early 80s. And, uh, you know, seeing a uh, pension check that would pay typically two months of their rent or mortgage now paying two weeks. And that's real numbers, by the way. And so uh, we saw that happen. And so inflation's a dirty word. It's a bad word to almost everybody who's like 50 and up. I know I don't look 50, but <laughs> stop, you're making me blush. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so no, he looks 70. Yeah, <laughs> right. Anyway, he looks um, 17, Paul. He looks 17. 70. But anyway, seriously. Um, uh, the, but inflation is one of the real estate uh, br uh, investors best friends. Uh, because if you can lock in low interest rates, which is something that Sam Zell didn't really have, I mean, he thought he did in the 70s, he locked in these seven to seven and a half percent interest rates. And then he wrote inflation that was as high as I think 15, 18%. And he was able to take that delta between the, you know, inflation rate and the lower interest rate. And that was all, you know, accruing to him in value. And, you know, he was able to ride these increasing rents because of inflation with a fixed largest cost. That's his mortgage payment. Well, how much better is it for us if we end up with 3% interest rates? I mean, we've got the lowest interest rates. They've studied this in 5,000 years of studied history of interest rates. And so, I mean, we just got, uh, we just invest in a big self-storage deal with a uh, interest rates at 3% fixed for 10 or 12 years, interest only for the first eight or 10. I mean, it's hard to beat. And so it's a great time to be a real estate investor and to hedge against this inflation. Now, somebody could argue it's only in nominal gains, meaning in name only. But even if that's true, because inflation is taking such a bite out of the value of the dollar, wouldn't you rather be on that side then have your money in something that's not inflating along with inflation? You know, it, it really is. I just, I do some, you know, YouTube videos about this topic where it's, it's really a double positive. I mean, if you're in cash flowing assets, such as large multifamily self storage, mobile home parks, it's the value will continue to rise because inflation generally leads to higher ownership costs, which eventually gets turned into higher rents. And also, like you mentioned it, the debt, is this low fixed debt that you pay off in future dollars that are actually worth less. So the Delta just keeps moving further and further apart, the longer you have it. Yeah. And it's just, you just ride that wave, which is absolutely amazing. So I think getting out of cash is, is really important uh, during this time. So, um, you know, Paul, you and I, you know, we connect on a lot of levels, obviously you're just a great guy. And I just, I love talking with you and you're just such an abundance minded guy and just a person of character. But one thing that we really connect on beyond real estate is really both of our big why. We actually have kind of the same big why of why we're doing this. And I know it, it really involves um, human trafficking and there's 20 to 40 million human slaves in the world today. And a lot of people say, what does that have to do with real estate? But again, real estate is just a means to try to help uh, get people to their financial goals, as well as to really fight and end human slavery today. Can you talk a little bit about you know, some of your passion there? What, what are some things that you're involved with as far as uh, stopping human trafficking? Yeah, studies say that you're no happier after about in, in America or in North America, your, your income above 95,000 doesn't make you any happier. So if you're making 95 or 195 or a million and 95, you're not going to be any happier. But 
there's got to be a reason for us to have this abundance mentality and want more. And a reason is to develop a platform to speak to world issues and to community issues. I mean, we're here on this earth to love God and love other people and make this world a better place. And so if we can make this world a better place by rescuing slaves, that's a really, really big deal. And somebody could say, well, if there's 40 million and you can only rescue 100, what good is that? And of course, we all know Mother Teresa's answer is it meant the world to those 100. But um, yeah, if you did you know that if you took the, not the average, but the record profits, the record profits of Apple, General Motors, Nike, and Starbucks, rolled those record profits together, tripled that number, that's the approximate revenue generated by human trafficking every year. And, you know, I'd like to believe if I was alive in the 1800s, I would be an abolitionist trying to free slaves like William Wilberforce. Or if I was alive in the 1960s, I'd be looking to fight for civil rights. Well, this is a civil right. This is slavery, and it's happening right under our noses. And so Wellings Capital is working on a plan that every new investor who invests with us, we are going to free a slave in mm. their name. And then we're going to wow. tell that investor later, like, hey, here's the day that the slave was freed. Here's what town they're in now in the Philippines or Cambodia mm. or Belize, which is a huge trafficking mm. hub, by the way. And uh, if you want to, Mr. or Mrs. Investor, you can get involved to help them get education, clothing and housing and counseling now. And so that's what we're working on. We plan to have it up and running really soon. And we're very excited about this. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. My, uh, my sister runs an organization called Dressember, which women wear dresses and guys wear bow ties in the month of December. And they create awareness on social media. They've raised, like, I think I've raised 20 million for multifamily. They've raised like 30 plus million for fighting human trafficking. And just some of the stories that I've heard are just absolutely amazing and heartbreaking. And uh, but, you know, just, just, you know, the resources that many of us have, any of the listeners and you and I as well, we have is just a lot of people would literally give anything to be free and they don't have the resources to do it. And there's a whole bunch of stuff down that, that rabbit trail, but um, you can, you can also check out my sister's website, dressember.org if you're interested in learning more about that. But uh, again, I, I talk a lot about stuff that has to do with values and the why behind real estate. And I think for a lot of people listening to there's, you know, the idea of leaving, leaving a legacy and how do we want to leave the world for our kids? And just, we, we come down to really the things that are really, really important. So uh, Paul, uh, shifting from this a little bit, uh, what advice would you give to someone starting out as a passive investor? Now, maybe they're new to real estate, they're new to just kind of learning about all this. How can somebody kind of learn more and educate themselves? And just what advice would you give? I recommend that if you're starting out as a passive investor, you don't just jump in with the first syndication deal you see. I talked to a guy who did that today. Uh, it might be the best deal you're going to find, but you should compare. And a great way to compare is to get this bigger pockets book called The Hands Off Investor by our friend Brian Burke. And Brian gives you all kinds of data in 300 plus pages here to help analyze syndication deals. Another opportunity that's not as well known is called the Real Estate Crowdfunding Review. And it's a place to review, to look at ratings and reviews and stories from real live investors, from syndicators and funds. It's not just about crowdfunding. When Ian Ippolito started this website, it was about crowdfunding in 2013 or 14. But it's now about all kinds of syndicators and funds. And, you know, you and I can't join that website. We can't look inside. It's We would get prosecuted because we're syndicators or raising money for deals. But investors uh, are able to share their real life stories and their real feedback in the real estate crowdfunding review. That's great. I've read uh, Brian Burke's book, uh, The Hands-Off Investor. It's very good. It's very detailed. It's very detailed. Little, little gets in the weeds a little bit on some stuff, but it really gives you a good overview as far as you know things you should look for, particularly the numbers from an operator. And he's a stellar guy, so I, I do definitely recommend that book. And I love that the real estate crowdfunding review. So I obviously you and I can't check that out because we're you know on the other side of that. But that's yeah. a great way to, to also talking to other investors, right? And people that are experienced of their you know their particular experience is really helpful. Um, right. I was just going to ask you, uh, you know, before we kind of kind of wrap this up. 
Uh, what's one resource as well? I guess you give a couple of resources there, but is there anything that you use uh, in your real estate that, you know, you mentioned, you know, the book and that website, but it's just something for you that helps you in operating or in ways that maybe if somebody's more active or just looking to, you know, what are some things you look for in certain markets or just some tools that are there? Yeah. So for example, in multifamily, uh, when we were doing that, we had about 23 metrics we were looking for in a market that we wanted to be mostly positive. We wanted unemployment to be in the top half of the lowest unemployment in the U S we wanted a multifaceted economy, you know, with like, you know, maybe government universities, healthcare, not dependent on one industry, like, you know, not the auto industry, for example, like Detroit, uh, we wanted it to have, uh, here's a real big one, net positive net population migration, which means more mm. people are moving in than out of a market. We wanted an MSA over half a million people because we wanted to have multiple choices for property managers. And this was all in multifamily. A lot of those things I just said don't apply at all to mobile home parks and even self-storage. They have a different set of metrics, but those are some really good ones. If you're looking for self-storage, go to Radius Plus. It's a website and a software as a service that allows you to check uh, all kinds of wonderful demographic data just for self-storage. Yeah, awesome. Well, Paul, I really, this has been a great time and I just have really appreciated, you know, you over the years just want to really acknowledge your abundance-minded attitude, the way that you really try to better people's lives. Uh, you're very generous in giving of your time and you've added a lot of value as far as the resources, your book. I guess I'm really excited to read your upcoming book about self-storage, but uh, thanks so much for coming on. Just wanted to say thank you for this time. How can people reach out to you if they'd like to get in touch with you? Well, Bronson, like I said, I spent years trying to figure out how to get involved in commercial real estate and didn't know how. So we've created a resource for people. It's a five-day free e-course, or if you can't wait five days, we've got it all bundled together in one package now. But it's um, at Wellings Capital, that's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, wellingscapital.com forward slash resources. And that's where you can get that information. Awesome, Paul. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at a live event soon. I think you're going to be at the New Orleans conference. I will see you there in a bit. So it's going to be awesome. All right. Thanks, Bronson. It's been a real honor. Thanks. All right. So this was a great interview with Paul Moore. And one thing I love about Paul, like I mentioned, is just his attitude of abundance. In real estate, uh, I get a little concerned when people are only really looking out for their own group, their own deals. They're very secretive. When people share information, when they're abundant minded, uh, typically I find those are people that uh, they really care about how other people are doing and how their experience is uh, doing that investment. So I find some of the best folks, and maybe it's just the folks I identify with, but I always find if people are open, they're collaborative, they're helpful, uh, you know, there's a lot of abundance that comes from that. And actually instead of the pie thinking like, oh, the pie is only this big, We've got to split this up. If you get this, then I'm not going to get it. It really is that the pie can actually get bigger. And that's the amazing thing about real estate. It's been amazing about capitalism. It's that as we help each other, um, it allows us to continue to grow as a group. So a few real takeaways from that. Uh, really, when it comes to great deals, the value add component is really important. Uh, there's a lot of creative ways as well that Paul is adding value by finding deals that are off market. Uh, off market deals can, you know, mean that you're not, you know, one of a ton of people at the table, but you actually have a better shot of winning a deal and also helps you solve a problem for somebody who is selling. Um, and then with that said too, like I talk about it quite a bit is the why of what you're doing is sometimes more important than the what. So for both Paul and I, uh, you know, our big whys are really trying to help stop human slavery in the world. I believe we can do it. Uh, the number is 20 to 40 million human slaves today. The number is absolutely staggering. I live in Los Angeles. I mean, that's, you know, two to three times the size of the greater Los Angeles area, but it can get better if we actually start caring and doing things about it. So um, anyway, thanks for taking the time to watch this, to listen to this. Um, really appreciate it. Um, feel free to reach out and look forward to seeing you on the next show. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money Podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. 
None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.